fill up with all our attendees today. Hey guys. Good morning. While you're waiting, you can see this is the space where I write my books. I, because of quarantine, I'm working from home. So I have a tiny little attic upstairs. It's very cozy. Uh, it gets cold in the winter, so we'll see how that goes. But <laughs> this is where I sit and I write my stories. I'm very excited to talk to you guys today. I know we're still getting some a few people in, but yeah, it I feels. Think I think we're good. Let's let's get oh, yeah? started. So, okay. good morning, everyone. Welcome to PMP Live. My name is Margaret Orto, and I'm the events coordinator at Politics and Prose Bookstore. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for our event this morning with Jonathan Oxier. We're celebrating the publication of his new book, Will of the Wisp, and it's the first book in his new series, Fabled Stables. Um, today, we're going to be dropping the book purchase link for Will of the Wisp into the book chat during the conversation. So you can order the book with that with the link today. Um, and always, you can order it from our store, either online or in person. And we do have signed book plates available with book purchase while the supplies last. So that's just another added bonus um, uh, for today. Um, we're also going to be, um, you'll have the opportunity to ask a question at the end of the presentation. Um, so you can ask a question by clicking Q&A, and that's located at the bottom of your screen. You can also upvote on a question that you'd like to see answered. And teachers, I just want to mention, if you're sharing your screens, thanks for entering students' names, uh, you know, first names, if you're able to, um, and we can give a shout out to whoever is asking the question. Um, and then at the end of Jonathan's presentation, as I said, we'll get to as many of the audience uh, questions as possible. Please remember, this is a creative, safe space, and we ask that attendees be respectful of one another in any questions and comments. So now for introductions and the event you're waiting for, I'm pleased to introduce Jonathan Oxier, who writes strange stories for strange children. His books include Peter Nimble and His Fantastic Eyes, The Night Gardener, and Sweet. Will of the Wisp is his newest book and is the series opener of the Fabled Stable series. He's here to tell you all about this newest book. So take it away, Jonathan. Hello, everybody. So I'm hopefully sharing a screen. Margaret, can you give me thumbs up if it's working? All right, I'm going to assume it is. Um, so my name is Jonathan Oxier, and I'm very excited because, uh, as was said, I have a brand new book that's out today. Now, some of you may or may not know me, so just a little bit of kind of context for who I am. I write strange stories for strange kids. And uh, maybe, hopefully, we have a couple of weirdos out there um, who are also big fans of storytelling. Um, so you might know some of my other books. They're often for slightly older readers, but I wrote the Peter Nimble series, which is an adventure series about a blind thief. I also wrote the very spooky book, The Night Gardener, uh, a book called Sweep, which is about a girl and her monster. And today, I am here to talk to you about the fabled stables. I'm so excited about this. This book is a brand new book. It just came out, and it's the beginning of a new series for younger readers. And so I'm really excited about this book. It's gorgeous, it's very cool. It's about 90 pages long, which is kind of long, but it's got beautiful full color illustrations on every single page. Now, one of the thing that's, things that's great about that is instead of just telling you about the story, I can actually show you the story. And this is a great way to use Zoom. So what I'm gonna do is actually share with you, read to you the beginning of this new book, Will of the Wisp, and you're gonna see the pictures from the book as I read. It's like a miniature TV show. So now we're gonna dive straight in and read the first book in the Fabled Stable series. I'm gonna kind of get you started. and It'll introduce the world. You have to promise not to make fun of me or laugh because I'm gonna to try to do voices and things like that. So here we go into the Fabled Stables, chapter one. At the top of the world sat an island and at the heart of that island lived a boy named Augie. Everyone's good at something. Augie was good at caring for animals. Wherever he went, turtles peeked from their shells, birds hopped closer, and worms wriggled up from the ground. Now, Augie, in most ways, Augie was just like other children, except for one thing. Augie had a job. Most jobs are boring grown-up things, but not Augie's job. Augie worked at the fabled stables. The stables looked very small from the outside, but on the inside... They were filled with one-of-a-kind creatures. Some were magical, some were mysterious, some were just plain weird. 
Augie marched between the stalls. He sang, come big, come small, come breakfast for all. And the hungry herd rushed to meet him. Now animals can be picky eaters, but luckily Augie had a magical horn of plenty. All he had to do was reach inside and pull out the exact food that East Beast loved best. He fed the hippopotamus, the bush squid, the long-beaked curmudgeon, and the yawning abyss. Augie loved his amazing beasts, and they loved him right back. That didn't stop a few of them from trying to eat him. But just like each of these creatures, Augie was one of a kind. He was the only boy on the island. And even the best job in the world can get lonely without a friend. Do you think the wampus ever feels lonely? Augie said. So what if she's lonely? muttered Fen. At least she's not face down in a pile of dung. Fen was also one of a kind. He was a thing called a stick in the mud. He could make himself into any shape that Augie needed to do his job. Right now, Augie was using Fen as a rake. Maybe you and I could be friends, Augie said. Fen rolled his eyes. I'll take my chances with the dung. After breakfast came hurly burly hour. Augie opened the stable doors. By branch or stream or field or track, I'll see you all for mid morn snack. The beasts galloped and slithered and flapped and skittered all over the island. Animals in the fabled stables were never locked up. They were free to roam wherever they pleased. There were no cages or leashes or collars. While the beasts hurly burlied, Augie went to visit Miss Bunt in the plotting shed. Maybe she would play with him. Ahoy, Augie, Miss Bunt called with a hearty smile. She had the sort of smile that made you want to smile back. Augie sat next to her. Can you tell me the story of one of your tattoos? He was pretty sure that Miss Bunt used to be a pirate, but she would never admit it. I'm afraid I can't right now. She cinched a knot with her teeth. I'm working on this ladder for Professor Cake. He needs it finished by moon up. The whole island belonged to a man named Professor Cake. He was very old and very clever. He collected things that were one of a kind. Things like Augie. Augie looked at the ladder. He couldn't see the end. Why does Professor Cake need such a big ladder? Your guess is better than mine, Miss Bunt wiped her brow. I learned not to bother asking the professor why a long time ago. Augie nodded and sighed. Sometimes I wish Professor Cake was a bit less mysterious. Aye, you and me both. Augie watched Miss Bunt work. He wondered if she felt lonely, too. He was about to ask her if she had any friends before she came to the island when BOOM! The stables shook and shuddered and twitched and sputtered. A moment later, everything was silent. Augie watched as the doors of the stable gently swung open, as if they were inviting him inside. What just happened? Augie said. Miss Bunt helped him up. A look of worry snitched across her brow. Seems like you should go find out. Augie stepped into the waiting stables. They felt different than before. The air smelled musky. The ground felt soft. The wooden beams were creaking gently, as if the walls themselves were breathing. At the end of the row was a new stall that Augie didn't recognize. That stall wasn't here this morning. I'm sure of it. Fen hopped to his side. Of course it wasn't here this morning. Don't you know anything? We have a new arrival. New arrivals were nothing new. Sometimes Augie would wake up to discover that the stables had rearranged themselves. There would be a new stall and a new beast to care for. But this felt different. This felt urgent. I've never seen the stables change in the daytime like that, Augie said. It must mean something. Fen sniffed. It means there will be more dung to shovel. Now that is the beginning of the fabled stables. And what happens after that is that Augie comes to the stall and sees a sign above it for a mysterious creature called a wisp. And he has to venture into a dark and dangerous swamp full of ferocious hounds and devious hunters who are trying to capture this creature. And with the help of one of his one-of-a-kind beasts, an enormous gargantula, Augie manages to find and rescue the wisp, whose name is Willa. And she becomes his friend. And that's really the core of the Fabled Stables series. Every book in this series will be about how Augie, Willa, and Fen venture out into the wide world to find and rescue a different one-of-a-kind creature. Now, when I'm talking with readers, a lot of people have one question, uh, and I hear it all the time, and the question is, where do I get my ideas? And the answer is, I figured I could share this with you. So first of all, pretty much all of my ideas come from this magic book right here. 
Now this is a journal, an artist journal, and it starts with blank pages, but over time, I start filling in these pages with little doodles and drawings and things that I see. And my favorite thing to put inside my journals are little drawings of monsters. And that's exactly where my stories come from. I'm doodling, I'm letting my imagination wander, and suddenly something kind of pops into the pages and I wanna know more. You can actually see this as, you know, when I was uh, once years ago, I was sitting doodling, just letting my mind wander and I drew a little picture in my journal. And it was of a little boy, kind of an old fashioned, he's wearing almost like a monk's robe and he's in this cramped stables full of all these different creatures. And at first I drew ordinary creatures like you can see that horse and then more exotic things like the elephant. And then I kept on filling in the details and the creatures got stranger and stranger. And I wanted to know more about this little boy and what this place was and how a little kid like him could even have a job like this. And so I created the fabled stables to answer all the questions inside my journals. And that is really where all my stories have always begun for all of my books. So now I figured I could give you do something special and give you guys a unique sneak peek inside my journals. Most people don't get to see what's inside my journals, but I figured I could show you. I took some photographs of the pages and I uploaded on here. These are some drawings and doodles of different monsters I've used. Now, uh, one of the things you'll notice is I draw with black pen, a black pen. I use a very simple pen goes like this. Uh, it's like this. They're easy to find, but the thing I like about it is it slides right into the spiral end of this so I can never lose it. But one of the things that's important about using a pen is unlike a pencil, it doesn't have any eraser. So if I make a mistake, I kind of just have to scribble it out and keep on going. And you can see that I've written notes down and I've messed up words. So I just kind of cross them out and keep moving. Or in that picture of the turtle in the top corner, you might notice that I messed up the curve of the shell. And so I just kept kind of drawing and redrawing. Same with the turtle's beak. I don't pause to make my pictures in my journal perfect. Instead, I'm just trying to get the idea down. These aren't works of our art. These are just little tiny doodles. And as you can also see, one of the things I love to draw are strange and unusual creatures and monsters. And there in the bottom corner, you can even see a new drawing of Augie and Fen right next to him. Now, as soon as people have been picking up this book, I've noticed something, and this has been very exciting for me. Kids don't just enjoy reading the fabled stables, but as soon as they read it, they usually come to me with drawings and doodles and ideas for their own strange and unusual one-of-a-kind creatures. Pretty much all the creatures you meet in the fabled stables are sort of made up. They're not based on uh, existing magical creatures. There aren't kind of unicorns or griffins in this world. I'm trying to make the creatures kind of a little distinctive and different than what I've read about, because that's some of the fun, is making up the monsters. And so I have some tips that I use when I'm trying to create one-of-a-kind creatures, and I thought I could pass them along to you because they might be helpful as you guys think of your own one-of-a-kind creations. So here are three tips. The first one is very, very simple, and that is to exaggerate one part of an ordinary animal. Now, exaggerate means to make something bigger than it is in real life. So if you exaggerate a story, when you retell it, you're going to tell it like it's bigger than what really happened. And with an animal, what you're gonna do is you're gonna take one part of an animal and you're just gonna make it bigger. So we have an example here. Here's a little doodle from my journal of an elephant. And I can take one piece of this elephant. I'm probably gonna take the trunk because the elephant's trunk is sort of what it's famous for. But what if the trunk was really, really long? Well, you can make this enormous long trunk, so long that the elephant will trip on it if it tries to walk. Or maybe uh, sometimes a prankster might tie it in a knot if they want to annoy the elephant. And we have to change the name to reflect that it's this kind of new creature. So I'm going to focus on the nose. And instead of an elephant, we can call it a smell elephant. All right. So let's try another example of this. We can take something like a pony, just a nice, simple pony standing there. We're going to make one part of it big. Instead of the front, like the smell elephant, we're going to go to the back. And let's try to make its tail even bigger. Let's make it humongous. So now we have this enormous, fluffy, uh, ponytail, um, we can call it that. Uh, now that I look at the drawing, it kind of looks like it's farting out clouds, which is kind of cool, I guess, but a little gross. Um, let's move to our next tip. We've got a second tip here, and this is a time-worn, tried and true method of creature creation. People have done this all throughout history, is take two ordinary animals and mash them together to create something new. And this is how we get magical creatures like the griffin or the hippogriff or the minotaur. And in this case, I'm gonna take uh, a bull and I'm also gonna take a frog. So we have a little doodle of a bull there. He's snorting and ready to go. And we've got a frog ready to hop. And all I'm gonna do is take one part of each creature and then mash them together. So we'll take the head of the bull and the body of the frog and we smush them together and we get a bullfrog. 
Now, of course, a bullfrog is a different thing in real life, but it's fun to take that name bullfrog and then turn it into this unique mashed up creature with the head of a bull and the body of a frog. I suppose as I look at this, we could switch these two around and we could instead do the head of a frog and the body of a bull. Then it doesn't have as good of a name. We'd call it a frog bull, I guess. Yeah, that doesn't look quite as special as the bullfrog to me. So sometimes there's trial and error. You try an idea, you put it down, you fiddle with it a little bit and see if you can make it better. Now, the last tip, and this is my favorite one, because I am a writer and I love words and wordplay. So whenever I'm trying to create a creature, one of the things I'm most interested in doing is playing with the name, taking the name of an ordinary creature or an ordinary thing in the world and seeing if I can make it just a little bit sillier. So in this case, let's do an example here. We have a reindeer. And this example, I should say, actually, I stole from my youngest daughter. She's in third grade and she had an idea for creatures. She's like, dad, you could put this in the fabled stables. And I was like, that's a pretty good idea. So she had a reindeer, but she hated the way reindeer was spelled because it always confused her. There's so many other ways to spell the word rain. And she thought, what if I spelled it like the rain coming down from the sky and we could make a new creature called a R-A-I-N reindeer with a storm cloud following it everywhere it goes. So whenever it wanders into a room, there's a huge stormy cloud just splashing water everywhere. And that's a great example of how all she did was take the name of an existing creature and play with it a little bit, make a joke out of the words of the name, and suddenly you find yourself with a new, one-of-a-kind creature. So those are some tips about the fabled stables and where this kind of story came from. And I draw a lot of monsters in my journal. I should say I did not do the art in this book, though. The book was illustrated by an artist named Olga Demidova. She is a brilliant artist, works much more beautifully than I ever could. And I'm so excited with the way that all of her strange and unusual creations, her creatures and her characters turned out. There's one last thing about this story that I think is worth talking about. Here is a picture actually. This is me looking very exhausted, reading to my three daughters. I have three little girls. And one of the things that was really tricky with this book and really with read alouds altogether is that I have three daughters, three different ages. They are four, six, and eight years old. And if you have any younger brothers or sisters, you know that reading aloud together can be tricky because you are probably ready for a longer, more involved story. But if you've got a younger sibling, they really just want picture books. They want pictures constantly, bright, full color pictures, and they can't sit through a longer book. And so my goal with The Fabled Stables was to make a book that kind of was a mixture of the best of both worlds. It's a longer story. It's almost 100 pages. And, but the word count is very low. The book only takes a, you know, one bedtime sitting, 15, 20 minutes tops to read through the whole thing. And there's full color pictures every single page. And so your younger sibling can kind of sit through and enjoy the story while you get to enjoy this big, long, adventurous plot. So that is a little bit about the Fable Stables. Like we've said, this is a series, so there are going to be more adventures with Augie, Willa, and Fen coming out every single season. The first book just came out this last week. It's called Willa the Wisp. After that, we've got the second book coming out this spring, which is called The Trouble with Tattletales. It's really, really fun. These creatures called Tattletales latch onto the backs of everyone like giant fluffy tails, and they tattle on them whenever they do something wrong, and it drives everybody crazy. So this is the series. Every book has a new one-of-a-kind monster. It's this uh, kind of novel-length picture book, a read-aloud for all members of the family, 100 pages with full-color illustrations on every single page. And I am so excited for you to discover this world. So that is a little bit about the fabled stables. And now I think we have some time for, I know some of you have come up with questions and answers, so we can dive right in. Yeah, let's let's do it. Um, that, that's that's great. Um, so um, just uh, before we get started, um, not a question, but um, just a comment um, from from one of the uh, schools uh, watching today. Um, uh, we we have a student named Augie, and he has a sister named Willa. Oh my goodness! Uh, no, <laughs> that's pretty amazing. <laughs> <laughs> well, Augie and Willa, I've never met you, but clearly the universe has connected our brains together. But I will tell you all a little secret where the name Augie came from. The name Augie was actually inspired by Greek mythology. Now, maybe if you are Percy Jackson fans, you're big fans, you know about Greek mythology. And you may have heard of a character named Hercules. We also have Hercules in that Disney movie. And he had to do these many different kind of impossible feats that were using his strength and his courage. And one of them was cleaning out something called the Augean or Augean stables. 
And these were stables owned by a king named Augeus. And they were filled with thousands and thousands of horses and cows and donkeys and sheep. And they had never been cleaned, which would mean that they were piled to the ceiling with animal poop. And Hercules, for one of his feats, had to go there and say, I will clean out your stables in one day. And the king was like, there's no way you can do that. And Hercules was like, just watch. Now, Hercules is very strong, but he couldn't have cleaned that out. He couldn't shovel that in one day. So what he did is he broke a hole in the front of the stables, broke a hole in the end, and then dug a trench between two rivers. And the water swept through and washed out all the poop. And that is how Hercules cleaned the Augean stables. And when I was coming up with my own stables filled and filled with all sorts of strange and one-of-a-kind creatures, I thought it would be a fun way to sort of acknowledge the first and maybe most famous story about magical stables that I knew. Ah, that's great. Thank you. Um, all right. Um, another question from Katie. Uh, did you share your journal with the illustrator so she can see how you pictured the creatures? That is a really good question, Katie. It's hard as a writer, especially one who doodles and draws, because I get ideas in my mind for what some characters look like, but I also don't want to do the artist's job for her. She is a professional, and she has her own ideas about how these characters work. And so there were a couple of cases where I did show her pictures because I thought it was important for her to see what was in my head. Probably the biggest example of that was the character of Fen. Uh, when I was originally describing Fen, who's this living, talking stick, um, what, what she was drawing had a lot more kind of branches and, and kind of spouting off of it. And I thought it was kind of going to be too hard to draw because it was just going to take up too much of the page. And so we went back and forth and kept on kind of showing each other ideas of what Fen could look like. And she would kind of get it a little better. And then I would doodle it again, send it back, and then she would revise it again. And that was probably an example where we worked together to make Fen look like he looks now, just like uh, really, he was in my imagination, but I couldn't have done it without her work. But a lot of her ideas are all hers. And that is so fun to see, because then when I see the art, I'm as surprised as anyone to discover what these creatures look like. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Um, a question uh, from Julia from Lafayette, second grade. Uh, she wants to know how long it took to make the book. What a great question, Julia. So one of the things that's fun about these books, many of my books are longer books for slightly older readers, um, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth graders, and they take years and years. One of my books took me 10 years to write, and these books are shorter. They're about 3,000 words. Um, like I said, you can read them in 15 or 20 minutes, and what that means is that there weren't as many words, so there wasn't as much to write, and so the whole series to come up with, the first three books I've written now, that took about uh, two years um, but really, I had the easy job. Coming up with the story and writing the words, that was the easy part. The hard work was what Olga had to do when she did a hundred pages of illustrations, full color for every single book. And so in many ways, it took me, you know, again, uh, maybe at the most two years to write these books, but it's taking her a lot of time and energy to bring them to life with her amazing art. And so it's, it's, uh, it's sort of an easier job for me in this one instance. Fabulous, thank you. Um, Robbie from Lafayette wants to know, how, how long have you been an author artist? Great question, Robbie. Uh, I have been an artist my whole life. My mother was a painter, so I grew up always drawing and doodling, mostly monsters. Um, and I thought I was gonna be an illustrator for books, comics, picture books, things like that. Um, but as I got older, I realized I wasn't that great of an artist. I loved drawing, but I just, I didn't have the chops to make it as a professional. And so I had to go back in college and teach myself to become a writer. And that was hard work because I wasn't a very uh, skilled writer at that time. My handwriting is still atrocious. My spelling is awful. I did like to read, but I hadn't read enough. And so I had to actually teach myself to become a writer so that I could tell the stories that were in my head because I wasn't a good enough artist to do it. All that being said, I started uh, publishing books, kids' books. My first one came out nine years ago, Peter Nimble and His Fantastic Eyes, which is a story of the small blind orphan who also happens to be the greatest thief who ever lived. And I've been writing and publishing kids' books ever since, and I don't ever plan on stopping. Ah, thank you. Um, do you have a favorite book you wrote? Um, that's, this is Amelia who's asking that. Oh, Amelia, what a great question. Um, I have things on a different day, kind of my favorite changes. I won't say I have no favorites. I always have favorites. Day by day, it shifts. Um, right now, once I got the color art from Olga for the Fabled Stables, I really got excited. 
uh, back when we were just seeing the kind of the designs and the sketches, um, you know, I didn't know how the book was going to turn out. But when it kind of I finally saw this beautiful package, it really kind of became something that brings me a lot of joy. Um, I would say probably the book that I feel the most deep attachment to is the last uh, book I wrote for older readers, which is called Sweep, the story of a girl and her monster. And that was a book that I poured a lot of my heart into, and it still means a tremendous amount to me. Um, but it's hard to pick a favorite because day by, day by day, just like you as readers, you probably have slightly different favorite books based on your mood. So true. Um, now, Leo is asking, does your hand get tired of writing? <laughs> and I'm curious to know, do you, do you longhand your stories or do you use the computer? What do you use? So that's a big question a lot of writers talk about. Do they type at the keyboard when they're coming up with their story or do they write it out by hand? Most writers write on a keyboard these days. A few people write by hand. Um, my fingers do not get tired because honestly, the, the typing and the making the words is not the hard, hard part of storytelling. The hard part is done up here in your brain. It's really, really intense daydreaming as you're trying to come up with the story and what it's going to sound like. And so my hands, my fingers don't get tired. My brain gets tired though, because it is a lot of work to build a whole world and characters inside your head. And so I get, I get tired in the head, but not so much in the hands. Ah, that's, that's, uh, that's good. Interesting to hear. Um, so you touched on this a little bit, but um, Mia is asking, how did you get a love for writing? Well, that's a great question. My love for writing came where everyone's love for writing comes, which is a love for reading. I would not bother writing books if I didn't love reading books. Um, our house is packed full of books. Actually, we have so many books. We've got uh, an entire library on our main floor with the floor to ceiling bookcases on every single wall and they are spilling over. And so last night, my wife and I, she's also a hardcore reader. We just spent pulling off books because we couldn't keep any so many of them. Um, so we're reading all the time, always getting new books, always, always reading and discovering stories. And that's what made me love writing because it, you know, I think um, maybe you have heard of a writer named Kate D. Camillo. She's a very famous, one of my favorite living kids writers. And she had a statement she said in an interview once, which is she was talking about being inspired to write. And she said, sometimes you read a story and you love it so much that you want to tell a story back. And that really put words to the feeling that I get. Uh, nothing makes me more excited to write than reading a book I love. It makes me want to give a story back to the world somehow. And so in order to write, the first thing I'm always doing is constantly reading. Great, thank you. Um, and then do you, do you wanna just mention some of your favorite um, authors? You mentioned Kate DiCamillo, are there others Absolutely. that you wanna, wanna share? Sure, I, so I would say if, I, if I'm thinking of like my absolute all time favorite children's writers, uh, the first one would be Roald Dahl. Roald Dahl was really important to me when I was young. My, the first ever kind of long book I ever read on my own was in second grade. I bought it at a scholastic book fair with my own money I had saved up and I got a copy of Matilda by Roald Dahl, which is my favorite book of his to this day. It's still my favorite kid's book. I named one of my daughters Matilda after it. But one of the other authors that I also loved a lot and I'm getting to enjoy a lot because I have younger kids who want shorter illustrated books is I read a lot of Arnold Lobel. He is a writer and illustrator who's very famous for his frog and toad stories, which I adore. But he also wrote other wonderful, wonderful books. One of my favorite books of his is called Fables, which is sort of a, almost a modernized version of Aesop's fables. They're beautifully illustrated stories with kind of these little fables attached to them. And also maybe my all-time favorite uh, book of his is called Uncle Elephant, which is a book not a lot of people have read, but I absolutely adore. So he might be kind of right now, right up there with Roald Dahl as one of my absolute favorite children's writers. That's a good one. Yeah, thank you. Um, all right, um, here is a question, two questions, one from Eloise and, and one from Ronan. Why do you like magic so much? And what is your favorite magical animal that you have drawn? Oh, great question. So I like magic because magic is awesome. Um, I also like it maybe because uh, when I was growing up, my father was an amateur magician and we all had all these dusty old books about the history of magic and we were always practicing magic tricks together. Um, and, uh, and so that was something that was kind of infused into my blood. But I also like magic because that's how I want to see the world. I want to see the world with sort of enchanted eyes and I want to be awestruck and filled with wonder at everything I encounter in the world. And I think the older you get, it's easy to lose sight of that. 
everything kind of gets drained of its color and brightness and gets a little more gray and a little more ordinary. And I need stories to reawaken that sense of wonder. And so I want to write stories that are about characters sort of discovering the magic in everyday life. And that's part of the reason that a lot of my strange and unusual creatures are actually based in ordinary creatures. Because really, if you look at it the right way, every animal around us is amazing and bizarre. Just yesterday, I was going on a walk and I saw a cricket, not a cricket, a grasshopper, a huge neon green grasshopper. His whole body was shaped like a leaf. And I'm like, this is the most amazing thing I've ever seen. I couldn't invent something this weird. And I like stories that are full of magic that remind us that the world around us is full of magic. How nice, yeah. All right, well, um, going on um, that a little bit, another question is, did you ever add any animals that have cool powers? And the comment is from Joshua says that me and my older sister play and we imagine that our stuffed animals have cool powers. Oh, that is very cool. You are lucky that you have a sister that if you can come up with this cool idea and kind of play that out. I really, I think that's very, very neat. Um, so some of my animals have some strange abilities. Um, Will of the Wisp, that will, uh, who who Augie meets, um, she this wisp is born under moonlight and only lives for as long as the moon is in the sky. But she can change and shift her form into anything she wants, and she can fly. So there's some of the things that Willa can do. But I'm always sort of coming up with weird ideas and powers that these creatures might have, and sometimes that will feature into these future stories. Thank you. Great. Um, all right, we have a, we have a couple of monster questions. So um, from Cairo um, is asking, do you have a favorite monster? And and Graham is asking, have you ever made a monster out of a human instead of an animal? Ooh, great question. Um, okay, so uh, my if I have a favorite monster, I'm not sure I have a favorite monster. I have a favorite kind of animal, which is I'm ever since I was very young, I'm extremely drawn to turtles. I have no idea why, but turtles and tortoises like make my heart ache because I love them so much. I have no idea why. I just think they're these sweet, gentle creatures. Um, and so that's kind of, they're not monstrous, but I guess if they're big enough, they could be. Um, so I really like like old tortoises and tur turtles. Um, the other question, I forgot already. <laughs> oh, it was, uh, yeah, that's a good, let me, let me look that one up again. Um, we were asked, they were asking about um, uh, if you've ever made a monster out of a human instead of a Yes, animal. absolutely. I forgot. That is a, actually a really good question. I have sort of made monsters out of humans. First of all, my villains in my longer books are usually quite monstrous. Um, my books are pretty intense that way. Um, but my last book, Sweep, is a story is a story about a girl who discovers a golem. And a golem is sort of kind of like a monster made out of a human. A golem comes from Jewish folkloric tradition, and it's basically a creature in the shape of a human made out of clay that is then brought to life. They're kind of the original Frankenstein's monster. And so this golem, whose name is Charlie, is not made out of mud or clay in the traditional way, but he's actually made out of chimney soot because this girl is a chimney sweep. Um, and so she meets this golem that kind of matches her same identity and her experience in life. And he is generally shaped like a human and he operates like a human. And she kind of adopts him when he's very tiny and she has to raise him up almost like her child and he becomes her friend. And so in many ways, even though uh, the story Sweep is about a girl and her monster, as it says, um, Charlie is more than a monster and he really is something between a monster and a real live person. Oh, thank you. All right. Um, I'm going to combine a couple of questions and you, you have touched on it, but maybe if you don't mind repeating a little bit. Um, when did you start making books and when did you start writing books? And then remind us how many books you've written. Great. Um, so I have written, this is my fifth book I've written. Very excited about that. I actually, I should say when someone asked when I started writing, before I started writing books, I tried different kinds of writing. So I actually studied to be a playwright um, and that's where I, I, I got my MFA studying playwriting. And then I went out to Los Angeles to become a television and film screenwriter. And I worked that way and I still do a tiny bit of that work. Um, I've written and published comic books. I've done pretty much everything as a storytelling form. And it wasn't until I started actually writing the stuff I wanted to read, which was kids books, that it really clicked into place. So I've written now five books. This is my fifth book. And once I found writing for kids, because again, that was what I love to read, um, that really, I kind of left all those other things behind because it really was the, the best fit for my sensibilities and my interests. Right. 
Thank you. Um, we have a question um, and Max wants to know if you live in Washington, DC, which is a good question these days since we're all virtual. <laughs> I don't know if you want to share where you're coming in from or if you just want to say yes or no that you live in Washington. <laughs> I, I do not live in Washington, DC. Uh, I, I grew up uh, in Western Canada outside of Vancouver, um, but now I live in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. That's great, yeah. Um, and let me just ask this question from Claire. Uh, do you have a favorite thing to draw? Well, as I've mentioned before, Claire, I love to draw monsters. And so that's probably one of the biggest things I love to draw. Um, the other thing I really like to draw is just faces. I love drawing people's faces. And I remember as a kid, I would obsessively just draw heads. They were often bald and I would just kind of draw heads of people over and over and over again. And I loved kind of getting to know how you could draw a face so it would have the expressive qualities that really reflected kind of a real living person. And to this day, if I have a blank piece of paper and I'm letting my mind wander, the first thing I will do is draw two eyes and then from that, a nose. And it kind of spreads out from that. And so that's, I'm really drawn, I think, to, to, to faces. Fabulous. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, um, I think we're going to um, wind down with the questions, but I don't know if there's anything you want to just add um, before we close out the, the program. Yeah, there is one thing I want to add. You guys, this is a crazy thing that I'm doing right now. Ordinarily, my favorite part of my job is that I get to go and visit schools and bookstores like Politics and Prose bring me straight into schools and I do big assemblies and I do signings and it's my favorite part of my job. I love hanging out with readers like you guys in person. And we are in such a crazy moment in human history where we're doing all this stuff virtually. And two things I wanna say. The first is I am so impressed with all of you because what you're going through is really hard right now. And I feel like maybe you're not hearing that from a lot of people. Maybe you're just frustrated and being told to do a lot of things at school and in your life. And that's fine and that's necessary. But you need to understand that what you're doing is amazing and it's difficult. It's something that none of your parents have ever gone through. And you are learning a new way to be a kid in school and to be a kid in society. You're learning to take care of other people by being careful with how you are distanced with people. Maybe that involves wearing a mask, definitely involves washing hands. And that's an amazing thing. You guys are doing something hard and important. And the other thing I wanna say is none of this could happen if it weren't for politics and prose. This is a hard time for a bookstore to be operating because people can't just come in inside the bookstore. You can't just bring me into a school like they normally would. And stores like Politics and Prose, which is by the way, one of the absolute most famous independent bookstores in all of America, it's one of my favorite places. Um, you are so lucky to have a relationship with them and you're so lucky that they are creating events and doing things like this, even in the difficulty of a pandemic. So I do, do hope that you get a chance to read Fabled Stables. And I really cannot stress enough how important it is that you are supporting your local independent bookstore. If not with this book, then every other book you read. Holiday season is coming up and the store like this needs your support so that they can continue to do cool things like bringing authors out to talk to you. So I am so grateful for the amazing work they're doing in your community. I'm so grateful for the amazing work you are all doing. And this has been so fun to talk to you all. And I hope that you get a chance to check out the Fabled Stables. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Um, we really appreciate your kind words. Um, and we, we are so grateful um, to all of the people watching um, that you were able to join us today. We did put the book purchase link into the chat again um, and our stores are open so you can stop by or you can do online ordering. Um, but, but most of all, thank you, Jonathan, for being here today and sharing, um, you know, your, your inspiration, the, the, the wonderful new book that you've produced, um, and thank you for sharing it with the audience. Um, and thanks, audience, for joining us again, and stay safe, everyone.